Our next topic for the week is to start thinking about web services. We're going to be building front ends for back end web services. We're also going to be doing some work to create these back end web services. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, REST web, web services or representational state transfer. That's what REST stands for. So we, we talk about REST APIs, or you'll hear people refer to REST full APIs or web APIs, and we want to talk about what it means. So REST APIs allow you to access and manipulate web resources uh, via a, a predefined set of stateless operations. So I want to break down what that means. And we used to talk about documents, representing documents or files. But today we work with uh, more generic types of data, not just documents and files. Okay, so a quick bit of review. Before we dive in here, I'm gonna use a bunch of terms and I wanna make sure that you're comfortable with these terms. So the first one is URIs and URLs. I'll refer to both. You'll hear people talk about a URI or a URL and it's important to understand the difference. So. A URI, a uniform resource identifier, uh, is something that identifies a resource. In a minute, I'm gonna show you examples of this. A URL is a uniform resource locator, and it's used to identify resources, but it also includes information on how to get those resources, like where they are on the internet. So a URI is a name that uniquely identifies something. A URL is a way of getting at that thing. So all URLs are also URIs, which is why people tend to use these interchangeably. Okay, so we have an addressing system of URIs and URLs, and the protocol that we're gonna speak between um, those resources is HTTP. So with HTTP, we know that we're doing request and response type messaging back and forth between client and server or server and server. And, um, this is a protocol for working with these resources identified by URI, URIs. So when we talk about making a request, an HTTP request, we know that we're doing something where we are requesting an object. So for example, we are doing a GET request or we are posting data to the server. So we're submitting a form or we're asking that the server delete a resource. So GET, post, put, delete, all of these verbs that define the action that we'd like to take with our HTTP request. HTTP requests also include metadata. So this metadata is information about the request. It might have things like login information or information about the type of data that we're sending or what we expect to receive. We put all of those into headers, key value pairs that go into the request that we're making. We use paths as a way of specifying those URIs. So being able to say that I want customer number one, two, three, four, I wanna get the data for this or the website for this customer. And finally, we may have a body. So the body gives us a chance to send large pieces of data to a server like a form, for example, if we're gonna post a form. Servers respond back with a response. And so a response is similarly constructed to a request. It has a set of headers. The headers tell us how to interpret the data that's coming back. What is the type of the data? How big is it? Can we cache it? Um, is, has it been compressed? All sorts of things go into the headers in a response. The body is a byte stream of the actual response. Here's an image, here's a web page, here's a JSON string, whatever it is that's coming back. And we also get some kind of a response code. So everything worked, 200 or um, the thing that you're requesting has been moved, 300, or you didn't format your request properly, 400, or the resource wasn't found, 404, or the server crashed while trying to make a request to the database, 500, some kind of 500 error. So 200s, 300s, 400s, 500s, we have these response codes that we are gonna be working with. So understanding URLs, URIs, and HTTP is gonna be critical to everything we're about to do for the course because we're gonna be using that as the standard interface for working with server resources. One last piece of review, and that is JSON. So we're gonna use JSON extensively in all of the applications that we build. 
So what is it? It's this structured document format for passing data around. So the name implies that it is JavaScript specific. It actually isn't. J JSON is now used if you're in Python, if you're in C++, if you're in Java, you'll use JSON. So JSON is a universal serialization format for taking uh, data and serializing it to a string, making it, in other words, making it so that it can be written to a file or written to a network stream. And so it's really uh, convenient to send that between two endpoints, for example, over HTTP. So as you'll recall, we need to have key value pairs. We use double quotes for our keys and our keys have to be strings. We can include strings, numbers, objects, arrays, booleans, null values inside the um, JSON data. We can't have circular references. So JSON properties can't refer to other properties in the same object. And we use uh, the JSON parse and JSON stringify uh, APIs built into browsers and into Node in order to be able to serialize and deserialize these objects. Okay, so that's a quick review, but what I wanna do is I wanna show you some examples. Um, for a lot of the discussion of what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna take a, a web app, I'm gonna use the Starbucks website and I'm gonna show you how they've built it and how they use the techniques of what we're talking about. Okay, so we're talking for a little bit about REST APIs here and how they're structured. So here's the main features that I wanna talk about with regard to these. First of all, I have a separation of the client and the server. Number two, I have a stateless protocol between the two. Number three, I have a uniform interface for working with the resources and requesting them. Number four, I, I have cacheable endpoints. And number five, I have a layered system. So these are the, the, the points that I wanna pick up on right now. Okay, number one, separation of client and server. So I am currently on the Starbucks website. I'm, I'm, I've requested and received the website from the server. I, you know, there's a, star, there's a server sitting at starbucks.ca that I'm interacting with, one or more servers. And so I have this separation between myself and the server. So my browser is not, in, is not really deeply connected to that server. It makes a request, it gets the data, it renders the data and they, they're, they're separate. So the benefits of designing my, my site like this is um, my client and my, my front end and my back end, my client and my server don't need to know about each other's implementation. So for example, I could implement my backend in PHP or in Java or in Node.js, whatever I want, and I can keep the front end separate. So the front end can be, for example, here in JavaScript, but my front end could also be an iOS app, or it could be on Android, it could be written in Kotlin or something like that. And so I have a separation between the two and the way that they're connected is gonna be through communication over HTTP with like JSON data. It's really easy in this architecture for me to evolve the two ends. So I can change the front end separate from changing the back end. If they agree on the way that they exchange data, it's gonna become easy for them to um, be updated independent of each other. So the user interface is gonna be separated from the data. Now this is the biggest piece that's gonna be different from the way you've been doing it in 3.2.2 where your server was deciding how to present the data to the browser. So you were rendering uh, a template of HTML and sending HTML to the browser to do that. On the Starbucks site, they don't do it that way, which I'll show you in a second. So we're gonna separate it out so that we send data and then the client is responsible for taking that data and modeling it in whatever environment it is, whether that's an iOS app, an Android app, or in this case, if it's a web app, so it needs to be rendered for the web. Um, we can evolve the whole system this way without having to replace everything. So if I want to update the back end, I can do that. If I want to update the front end, I can do that. And I'm not limited. I don't have to do it all at once as long as the interface between the two stays the same. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, I'm going to pop open the dev tools here and we'll take a look at what's going on. So here we are on the Starbucks page. I'm going to go to the network tab and I'm going to load up the menu. So let's take a look at, uh, let me switch over here. So 
When I load the menu, I get all of these different resources are being requested and I'm getting back the response. So if we take the very first one here, I'm requesting the web page. So the HTML document. Document comes down to me, uh, transfer size 38 kilobytes. And you can see that over here, I've got my headers. So these are the request headers that went, that were sent from my browser to the server. And below that, you'll see, uh, actually in Firefox, it's um, split out. So I have the request headers and the response headers. Sorry, I have it backwards. So the response headers that are coming back from the um, server, if I click raw here, you'll see what it looked like, what, what they actually, how they were sent in the, the message. So you can see, for example, that we got a 200 okay. So the server sent back and said, yep, everything is good. Here's your response. Here's the thing you requested and I'm giving it back to you. Well, what did we, what did we request? You can see that we requested slash menu from www.starbucks.ca and the server is responding with 200 and saying, here's, here's what you get back. The server responds and says, the resource that I'm sending you is HTML. It's text slash HTML and the character set is UTF-8. So the headers tell me, here's how to interpret the thing that I'm sending to you. Uh, it tells me, for example, that this thing is cacheable. We're gonna talk about this in a second. You can cache it for 420 seconds or seven minutes. Um, you know, the date that it was sent, the size of it, uh, on and on and on, all this different uh, information that we'll, we'll talk more about. Now, if you look at the page that's been rendered here, you see that I have the Starbucks menu. I have a bunch of drinks, food, things you can have at home, drinkware, etc. So I have this clickable menu that I can go through. Now, if you were doing this with server-side rendering, what you would do is you would do a request to a database. Starbucks obviously has some kind of a database. They would then have a template. They would render that template on the server, generate the HTML, and they would send the HTML on to the, to the browser. Browser would render the HTML. Here, what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna separate that out and instead we're gonna send just the data. So if I trim this down, so instead of so showing you all of the resources that were sent, so JS files and fonts and PNG files, etc., the thing that I'm really interested in is I wanna see all of the XHR data. So I, I basically just wanna see everything that was requested after the page loaded. So when the page loaded, you'll see that another file was requested. So the browser has requested BFF slash ordering slash menu. This is, the, this is the, the resource that it asked for. And so the response comes back and it says, here's the response that you requested. And the type of the response that we get back is application slash JSON. So we're having a JSON document that has been sent back to us. So if I look at the response, let me show you, what, I'll show you the raw response first. Um, so here's the raw response. So I get a string of, it's huge, this huge string of JSON, and it has all of the items in the menu. Uh, in the dev tools, I can click here and I can expand this out, and you'll see what it looks like as um, a deep tree of nested JavaScript objects. So the menu, menus is an array, and inside here, it has these items. So it has item zero, one, two, three. So it has these four items in here. So the first item in here, the name is drinks. And you can see that that's what's been rendered here. And if I go down a little bit further, you can see the items that are inside drinks. Whoops. So inside drinks, there's a bunch of children. And the first thing inside here we have hot coffees like this. And you can see that um, down below here, I'm also given a URI. So the URI that I'm given for hot coffees is slash drinks slash hot dash coffees. So what's happening here is the server is sending to the client the data that it needs in order to display 
the, the, the final product, but it doesn't send any UI. It doesn't say, here's how you're supposed to show this menu. It just says, here's the data. These are the items, these are the sub items, and this is how you spell it. This is, um, this is the URI, so how you get it. This is the ID for it, etc. So etc. So hot coffees, hot teas, here's hot teas, slash drinks, slash hot teas. If I go and click on one of these things, so for example, if I click on hot coffee, I get another menu here. So if I were to click, let me go back to all so you can see. Uh, if I were to click on, say, this coffee right here, like so, and if I were to click on XHR, you'll see that I have another JSON document that's been sent to me. So this one has a single product in it. So it has an array of products. And inside here, I have Starbucks True North Blend, which is exactly what you're seeing right here. And down below it says description, lightly roasted coffee. So you can see up here, lightly roasted coffee that's soft, mellow, and flavorful. So the text has been sent to, as part of a JSON, as a JSON string. So here's all the data. And then the browser is, is responsible for taking all of that data and putting it into some sort of a UI for the user. So we have this real separation between the two. The server doesn't care that it's talking to a browser versus a mobile app versus anything. It doesn't matter what, what it's talking to. Like for example, I'll show you what I mean. If I were to um, pull up a terminal, I could use curl. And I could say, um, I'm interested in um, getting uh, JSON. I want JSON data, so I'm going to add a header. And I'm interested in getting this URL right here. I want to get the Starbucks menu. And if I do a request, it sends back to me the JSON for this. If I uh, did that again and I pipe it through a tool called JQ. JQ is an interesting tool for um, letting you parse and format uh, JSON on the command line. So I'm going to pipe this through JQ and when I do that, you see that I get back the same JSON that the browser had requested. So this is, you know, the entire menu, all of the information uh, for each of the different products that's available from Starbucks. So you can see that every product has a name, it has a product number, it has a type. Um, it also includes things like URIs. So for example, there's an image here, like this is the image for this product. So if I copy this, and if I were to load this into another tab, I get the picture of that item. So the, the JSON data is everything you need to create a user interface. It's not the user interface. It's not the web app. It's not HTML, but it's, it's what you need to create that. So what we need is we need some kind of a front end tool set, a framework that allows us to take all of this data and display it as a web page. But you can see that we have everything in here that we just talked about. So for example, a JSON document can have, it has these double quoted keys, so product type, and then we can have strings, we can have objects, so you can see here assets is an object, we can have arrays, so you can see for example here is an array with an object inside it, we can have strings, we can have numbers, we can have null. So this is, this is, JSON is going to be fundamental to the way that we do this, and HTTP is gonna be fundamental to the way that we request this data from servers and then make use of it inside the browser. So the browser is gonna be used to pull all of these things together, but we're gonna separate the client and the server. So the client and the server don't know anything about each other except for this URI naming scheme and being able to request these JSON documents. Okay, so another thing about REST APIs is that they're stateless. So I can request this menu over and over and over again, and it every time I make a request, I'm just going to get back this JSON data. The server's going to send it back to me, but the server doesn't really keep track of all of this stuff. Like the server doesn't remember a whole bunch of state. So, so you obviously need state in order to be able to build 
applications. Like think about, is the user logged in or not? Which language do they prefer? What are their preferences for all sorts of different settings? So what we do in a RESTful API is we move the state, a lot of it goes into the client. So if you go back to the Starbucks website, I'm sitting here on the Starbucks website. If I go to my storage tab, if I take a look at all these different storage areas in my browser. So in my browser, for example, Starbucks has put in information inside session storage. So session storage is gonna go away as soon as I close all my tabs for this. Like when I close this tab, I'll lose my session storage. And they have information in here about whether or not the fonts have been loaded. They've also put longer term storage. So for example, if I have a cart, so right now I don't have anything in my cart, but if I had added something to my cart, you can see that they have the information about the cart has been put into local storage. So the browser is hanging on to that. And if I were to refresh the page or close the browser, reopen the browser later, that would still be there. You can see that they've got stuff in IndexedDB. So if they wanna have uh, any information that, like IndexedDB is a full, it's like a, it's like a SQL database that they have access to that they can do all sorts of things. They don't have a lot of data in here, but they can put, so they have this vector in here. I'm not sure what they're doing with it. They have a whole bunch of cookies. So lots and lots of stuff in here from Starbucks about, I don't know, like tracking me for advertisement purposes or where I've been on the site or all these different things. And the reason they have to do this is because the server doesn't keep track of all of that. So the requests are stateless. So every time I'm making a request back to the server, what I'm having to do, like if we go back to the network tab here, if you look at the headers, you'll see that I'm constantly gonna be sending um, cookies. So you can see that my request included a cookie so that information gets sent back to the server. So I'm, I'm putting the state inside of the request. I'm having to keep track of it because these requests are stateless. So messages can be interpreted on their own without, um, like it doesn't matter one request to the next. They're all sort of separate from each other. Um, this design allows these APIs to scale really, really well because it's possible for somebody like Starbucks, if they get really, really popular and suddenly people are, are going to their website all the time, they can just add more servers. So they can scale uh, their application horizontally. And so I might make a request of a server and the first request goes to server one, the second request goes to server two, server three. So any number of servers can respond to my needs. If I need an image or a CSS style sheet or all this JSON data, it's really easy to get it from any one of them. I don't have any issues like that. So we talked number three about uniform interface. So we define our API in terms of resources and you can see already the way that this is working. Everything in here has URIs. So for example, this product has its own URI. Everything is named. So it's, it's very easy to locate things within the application via these URLs. So if it was a URL, it would have the, the entire thing. Like when I'm, uh, let, me, let me go back here. This is, this is a URL, right? Because I have HTTPS www.starbucks.ca. I have a location. I know where to go in order to do this work. But then I also have the URIs. So when I look at this, I have a URI, which is within that location, I can uniquely name all of those things. So slash product, slash this, slash single, or merchandise, drinkware, water bottles. So everything has this uniform naming style that we're gonna go through and we're gonna, we're gonna use this uh, lots and lots. Um, so we'll come back to this over and over again, but this is the way we're gonna lay out our data. So you'll notice that when we're doing this, you don't know what the back end really is. Like, are they using a SQL server or are they using a NoSQL database? Uh, what technologies are they using on the server side? We don't care. So we erase all of that and we instead layer on this idea of these uni this uniform interface. So by using URIs to name things, to make it really easy to manipulate resources on the server side, we can write our client applications to talk back to the server and, and, and do various things, get data, set data, delete data, and so on. Okay, another thing I wanted to show you, let me request this data again. 
but this time I'm going to ask it to um, show me the headers. So these are the headers that I get back from the request. So this is the what's coming back from the server. So the server comes back and it says, um, this is an HTTP2 response and I get a 200. So 200 meaning that uh, it was there. If I asked for something that it didn't know about, like for example, if I make a mistake, I'm gonna get back here, you can see I got back a 404 because it doesn't know what I'm asking for. But if I, if I ask for something that it knows how to respond with, it gives me a 200. And it says, okay, this is JSON data. This is uh, ENCA in terms of the language information. And then here's what I was really interested in. I wanted to look at this cache control. So in REST APIs, these responses that we get back are cacheable. So the server is gonna tell the client how long the client can rely on this information, how long can this information be stored on the client side and not requested again. So here you can see, for example, that Starbucks is saying that this document, this application JSON that I'm sending you is good for 420 seconds. After 420 seconds, you should request it again, but in the interim, you could, you could reuse this. So if I was to look, like if I turned on, let's, let's do this. If I refresh this page and uh, let me see, let me see if, uh, yes. Okay. So you can see here cached. Um, it didn't actually transfer any data. So when I'm, when I'm hitting refresh, you'll see that I'm this data, that this, uh, data, this JSON information over here is not being resent to the browser. It's being cached and that will ha continue to happen for, well, seven, seven minutes. If I was to disable my cache and if I hit refresh, then what's going to happen is it's going to have to download it and you'll see that it transferred that data. So I got that data, uh, and every time I do it, I'm gonna get that data over and over again. So REST API calls are great because they contain information about how, to, how long to, you can cache them for, and being able to cache this means that I can make my application run a lot faster because if the data is not changing that often, then I don't need to constantly update. Like think about how often is the Starbucks menu updating? Probably you could cache it longer than this. Um, but if you're working with an image or something that doesn't change very often, it's pretty common for sites to say, well, you can cache this for a year or, you know, like you can cache it for a long time because it's not ever going to change. You also see that they include this E tag. So the E tag is a hash that says, okay, the data that I'm sending you, when you hash this data, this is the, this is the unique ID that you get back from. So it's possible for the server to compare E tags with the client and say, if the E tags are different, then we should, you should download it again. So there's a lot of information that's baked into the response that allows you to figure out whether or not it's necessary to re-download this. So the clients can choose to reuse cache re, uh, responses instead of re-requesting data, making it a lot faster, especially important on mobile networks, especially in Canada, where you're paying ridiculous amounts of money for data. So uh, servers can cache in between, like if you're going across the network and there's multiple servers in there, they can do caching for you as well, which is how we use CDNs to make requests happen a lot quicker. Um, so I have, what was the last thing? Oh, layering, layering of the system. So the last thing is, um, speaking of caching servers and CDNs, when you're building a REST API, when you're building applications like this, computers in this design, they don't have to know whether they're directly connected to the server or not. So I'm saying here that I'm making a request to the server. It's very unlikely that I'm connected directly to the server. Uh, instead, I'm going to go across a whole bunch of other network machines. So uh, in this case, I may be going across load balancers, um, CDNs, routers, all sorts of different machines between me and the actual server that's sending me back this JSON. So 
those intermediate machines can provide cache, caching or proxying, load balancing, et cetera, to make things work uh, faster between the two endpoints. But all of that's invisible. I just have this system of, um, let me get this again. What I have is I have a way of sending data. I have a way of requesting and receiving data. It is standardized. It's sent as JSON. Uh, within this data, I have the ability to, to uniquely identify things using URIs, which I can then use as part of URLs when I'm asking for other pieces of data. So if I wanted to get a particular product, this is, this is the part of the path that I would use. So this REST design is critical for everything that we're going to build. We're going to rely on, on the idea of servers giving us data instead of UI. We want to build the UI using things like React and Angular and front-end tools, but we're not going to send HTML. In most cases, we're not going to send HTML. We're going to send just the data, and we're going to let the browser construct the application live in the browser when the data is received. So I'm going to give you an example of that today. Okay, I've got two more things I want to do with you, and I'm going to pause this video here, and we'll do them in subsequent videos. So the next one is... I want to show you how you write these or just do some review of how you write these REST APIs using Node and Express on the server side. And then finally, I want to do an example where I interact with, I build something like Starbucks. I want to show you how you would request data from a server and then dynamically uh, generate a, a little web app that uses that in the browser to be able to work with it.